Welcome to Public Health America, a weekly program produced by BronxNet in partnership with Mercy College. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Here on Public Health America, we speak with experts from an array of specialties across the liberal arts and health professions to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. We also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a liberal arts college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings, and engage in civil debate. Our experts will share decisions they made and support they received that helped them to beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It is my pleasure to have with me today, Dr. Ken Soprano, Professor of Biology at Chestnut Hill College in Chestnut Hill, just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Ken, welcome to the program. Thanks, Bill. It's a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to be here. Thanks so much. So, you know, pre-pandemic, I remember one time I told my uh, older sister, who's very accomplished, that I was in a, a department of mental hygiene at Johns Hopkins University, and she said, I didn't know that you had ever gone into dentistry. Uh, <laughs> um, meaning that pre-pandemic, you know, I think that the, if you will, the, the general population-based understanding of virology and epidemiology was, uh, you know, not significant. It's probably felt a little otherworldly. But of course, since the pandemic, I think most people, you know, hear the word, word epidemiology and or the word virology uh, quite frequently and then have been flooded with information. You've spent a 30 plus year career, a 40 plus year career, 15 years of which at Chestnut Hill College, uh, studying virology, teaching virology to thousands of students. Give, give us the basics. Let, educate the public about what they need to know about what virology is and why it's important. Great. Sure. Well, let's start with what a virus is. And a virus is an infectious microbe. Um, it's a small um, uh, uh, infectious uh, organism that you can't see. Uh, in fact, you need an electron microscope to see it. Uh, but it's unique uh, because it's a very simple organism. Uh, it only has either a DNA or an RNA core, and that's surrounded by protein. Um, and uh, it is from that, by that protein, that uh, that virus will actually be able to infect a cell because there's a molecule, uh, one of the proteins on the uh, capsid or on the, the coat of the virus that interacts with a, uh, a similar molecule on the uh, uh, membrane of the host cell, uh, whether it be a cell, whether it be tissue, whether it be an organ. Uh, and it is almost like a lock and key uh, situation in which uh, the two, if they fit, then the virus interacts with the host and can then infect that host and then initiates replication. Um, the other thing that's uh, unique is that um, these viruses um, unlike most other organisms, where when they divide, you go from one, one to two, right? Um, now, in the case of viruses, uh, they go from one to thousands because they actually are, are put together uh, and assembled. Um, and all the components are made first, and then these uh, components are put together, and they, um, are, you make then these progeny viruses. And so the implication of that is that all you need is one virus particle to infect, but once you have that one virus particle, it's going to make 10,000 virus particles, which are again, then going to affect 10,000 more cells. And so it, the virus will spread very rapidly. Um, I guess the other thing to keep in mind is that um, viruses are, are newly emerging. Um, COVID-19 is an example, but it's not the only example. There are a number of different uh, viruses that infect humans that, that do cause disease that uh, didn't exist, you know, a few years ago. Uh, and so 
as a result, um, you know, uh, we are constantly having to be uh, concerned or aware that there's new viruses coming up and, uh, and uh, we have to uh, surveil, have, have good surveillance uh, about uh, them uh, appearing and what their effects are. Sure. So that's a lot of very helpful information. Let's talk about COVID just for a moment in terms of the lock and key or anything else. What have we learned about COVID in terms of a basic, you know, virology and uh, why did it make the jump? Why did it get to humans? Well, you know, it's actually pretty common for viruses to move from animals to humans. Uh, for example, influenza is uh, very rampant in, in um, birds. And uh, um, it, that, again, is not the only virus that moves from animals to, uh, to humans. Um, viruses can move from the environment, of course, to, to humans as well. Um, uh, there are lots of different, um, you know, unique sources of, uh, of uh, what, what are called reservoirs, where viruses basically uh, can exist um, and be ready to uh, infect humans. Uh, we've actually uh, learned a lot about the, mo the molecules that are involved in um, binding to the host cell, and that's really where the, the basis of the vaccines um, are. Uh, these are uh, uh, vaccines that, that uh, elicit antibody responses that, or immune responses that block that interaction, that bind to that receptor. The other thing we've learned uh, about uh, this particular group of viruses, uh, they have what is called an RNA genome. And RNA genomes uh, tend to be uh, uh, very um, variable uh, because there is no uh, means of proofreading when uh, the, the genome is replicated. And so mutations happen all the time. And that's why we have so many variants of COVID because um, as the virus re replicates, it makes mistakes. And it's almost like a survival of the fittest. Um, so in, in, in that 10,000 know, virus progeny that I talked about before, you, know, you may have a uh, hundred different variants there, some of which are not viable and, and, and they die um, and, they, and they never are able to uh, infect others. On the other hand, others might infect more efficiently or um, you know, be, uh, replicated at a higher rate or speed uh, or be much more efficient at binding to the receptor. Um, and, and so when we get Omicron, for example, um, that was an example of a variant that, um, you know, uh, was uh, much more efficient than the Delta strain, which was the previous one. And it came, it came about because the virus simply replicated and made errors in the process. So along those lines ken let's talk about two interrelated things and i'll start with this one first you know clearly i think it's fair to say that while millions have uh uh voluntarily uh been vaccinated you know with the two doses you know one or more boosters uh there still is i think some hesitancy uh and and perhaps it remains just just uh, uh, insufficient, accurate knowledge uh, mm -hmm. about vaccine safety. W what's your w what are, what's your two cents about vaccine safety uh, with respect to COVID vaccine? Right. Well, you know, there is the, the, the vaccine hesitancy um, is not restricted to just COVID, uh, and in fact, um, even before COVID, there is a serious concern uh, with parents not vaccinated, not wanting to vaccinate their children against measles and mumps and rubella, and, uh, sort of the, the, the traditional childhood diseases. Um, and, um, you know, part of that is is just um, lack of experience or, or lack of uh, uh, having gotten the diseases themselves, because quite frankly, they were vaccinated as children. And so it, they were not aware of what's going on. Uh, with, with those kind of infections and what how, how bad they could be and how dangerous they can be. In the case of COVID, um, you know, uh, this is a sort of a new generation of vaccine uh, from the perspective of uh, social media um, and there being a lot more information 
um, some of it misinformation, a lot of it misinformation, in fact, available to people simply by going to Facebook or, you know, um, uh, literally looking on your phone at Apple News or whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I was a member of the, of the college's task force on COVID. And as the sort of resident virologist, my job was really to sort of screen uh, some of those stories that were popping up on social media and trying to uh, research what the scientific literature was behind the, those stories and, and decided whether or not uh, they were valid or not. Um, problem is that most people, you know, either, either don't have the knowledge or don't have the uh, uh, ability to, uh, to research these, or, or really, it's much easier to simply look on your phone, re, you know, read the, parag the paragraph about it and believe it. Um, and so it, I think that's, that's one of the difficulties. The second problem is that um, this particular, at least for the Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccines, uh, this is a new kind of vaccine. It's, uh, it's an RNA um, molecule that is um, generated and, and that RNA molecule that makes the antigen or the protein that elicits the immune response. And, um, you know, again, because it's new and it's not traditional, like all the other vaccines, there's concern about, um, you know, uh, uh, how safe it is. And again, we have in place the FDA that, you know, has certainly looked at um, clinical trials and you have experts on that panel that know how to read those that data. And, uh, and make uh, determinations, um, but people, you know, tend to be uh, somewhat, let's say, more cautious. But at the end of the day, aren't those trials and aren't the experts overwhelmingly stating that the vaccine is safe? Oh yes, they are. Um, and um, again, you know, one of the problems is I think, uh, you know, the general population is not very uh, astute at uh, statistics and understanding statistics. And, you know, if we go back decades to all kinds of other vaccines, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the rate of, uh, uh, you know, vaccine associated disease has always been quite low and COVID, if anything, is even less than that. Uh, but, you know, again, um, people don't look at the statistics. They just look at, oh, you know, there's a report that this particular, um, you know, vaccine has caused this particular problem in, you know, one person or two people or something like that. They don't look at the numbers and they say, well, yeah, two people out of a million or something, you know. Right. Uh, so that's so just, with, just with the moment left, um, you had mentioned, and, I, and certainly I've heard this before, you know, with the various mutations, is it just going to be a standard thing that every six months you get uh, or some period of time you get the next uh, COVID vaccine, just like you do a flu shot mm -hmm. annually. And, and the idea is that that updated vaccine will be protecting against as much as it possibly can. Is that, is, is that uh, the future or is it something slightly different? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's the model. I think what we, are, what we do for influenza is, is I think where we're moving with respect to COVID. And I think, you know, uh, in fact, I was reading something this morning, um, the FDA uh, is, is uh, putting out a report today, and then the, uh, the committee uh, is going to meet it again. I think it's on Thursday, uh, and make the recommendation that we actually wind up with an annual, um, you know, vaccine, uh, which is only basically designed uh, like the flu one is to try and, and guess which, you know, of the variants are going to come up in the next year, and 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 do the best we can to to predict. Uh, which, you know, if you look at flu, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, but it's the best we can do. I think people, uh, just based on, for example, how much the, the booster has been uh, used or the, the, the rate at which people have been vaccinated with the latest booster, the Omicron booster, is quite low, actually, uh, because I think people are just tired of it. And, and I, I don't think even though it's free and it's easy, you can go to CVS and whatever. Uh, I think people just, you know, it's, it's hard enough to get them to get vaccinated once a year, let alone sure. more than once. I mean, perhaps, I mean, so we're going to move to break. Perhaps we'll see, though. I mean, what I've read and what I've heard from the experts such as yourself is that 
another huge advantage of the vaccine is that it greatly lowers the severity of the symptoms if it's correct you get um COVID. and as people choose not to get boosters over time that Im immunity is going to wait mm -hmm. both for the mutation and just because uh, of the way the, the immunity will wane over time. So, um, you know, we might see a new wave of more That's serious right. reactions, and then that will motivate more uptake of booster. Yeah, um, that's yeah. exactly right. And, and you know, that's the, that's the fear is that um, the longer you wait to get booster, the, the less, you know, uh, immunity you have. Um, and then, you know, you've got issues like herd immunity, uh, is reduced and everything else as well. So, you know, um, unfortunately, um, you know, unless people get sick uh, and get hospitalized and start dying again, I think, uh, you know, people tend to, you know, not take it as seriously uh, because it, it, it's not something that's front and center that, that they're seeing neighbors and family members, you know, uh, have uh, serious infections. Um, sure. So we're gonna take, with that, we're gonna take a quick break when we return, Dr. Ken Soprano of Chestnut Hill College in Chestnut Hill, right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, will be telling us a little bit about his academic journey as an undergraduate and beyond and how that set the table for his having the excellent career he has had and has. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We'll be right back. Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Ken, so in the second part of the segment, I always open with the exact same question. Uh, where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your formative experiences. Great. Well, I was uh, born actually in, in North New Jersey um, and grew up in Clifton, New Jersey, which is in, in Northern New Jersey. Uh, it's really a, a bedroom community of, of Manhattan. Uh, and uh, my parents were, you know, um, blue collar. My uh, my father worked for the post office, um, and my mother uh, worked at that time at a, at a department store called Bamberger's, which then uh, is uh, was bought by Macy's. And uh, I was, in fact, the first uh, in, in my family to go to college. Um, I actually um, went to high school at St. Benedict's Prep in Newark, um, and um, as a as a Benedictine. Uh, high, high school, uh, they, of course, had very good relationships with a number of um, Catholic colleges and especially Jesuit colleges. And uh, one college I chose to go to was the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, and um, I uh, uh, was one of actually nine students in, in the St. Benedict's class of, of 1970 uh, that actually uh, went, went up to Holy Cross. It was fairly common for a reasonable number of our, our graduates to go go there. Uh, and, um, it, you know, in those days, things were a little bit different in terms of applying to colleges. Uh, you know, they weren't wined and dined, you know, for the most part, there weren't even any tours or anything like that. You'd go up for an interview. But because there had been a lot of St. Benedict's uh, graduates there, I was able to actually run into one of my friends from the previous class. Um, and, uh, you know, when my parents and I uh, when went up there, we uh, visited and, and he took us around and uh, I just felt very comfortable. Um, you know, and I, I saw the same thing with my own children, you know, when they were applying to colleges. Um, we looked at a lot of different colleges and, you know, by some coincidence, it just so happens that, you know, one place just feels comfortable, feels like home. 
and that's what they wound up selecting. Is a, uh, neither of them went to Holy Cross, but they found the place that they were comfortable in. And you know, uh, I st I studied biology. I, I was uh, yeah, interested in biology from a fairly young age. Um, actually, eighth grade, we had a biology uh, a segment of our science of curriculum there. And so, um, you know, when I, once I got to Holy Cross, I studied uh, biology and uh, uh, initially thought about being a doctor, being you know, an, an MD. Um, and, uh, but, you know, when I was actually a senior, I took a course in microbiology uh, from a professor uh, who taught the course. And it was a very unique course because um, the laboratory of that course was uh, an open lab. Uh, he literally uh, walked in the first day with a bunch of Petri dishes and he handed them out to everybody in the class and he said, go outside and open them and come back in 10 minutes. And we came back and he placed all the um, Petri dishes into the incubator. And the next day, things had grown up on him. And the lab was basically um, designed for the rest of the semester to characterize what had grown um, on uh, those plates. And that whole idea of investigating something um, and not having an, an answer to what potentially was there and, and having to do tests and, and then interpret those results and things gave me the, uh, the thought that, you know, perhaps a graduate school uh, in biology might be the place to go and uh, to go next. And, and so, um, but, you know, Holy Cross didn't really train a lot of, of PhD uh, can, uh, type students. They, they were mostly involved in health sciences and, and medical school. Uh, so I had no clue about graduate school or how, how it worked. Uh, I applied to Rutgers because that was my state college or university and my blue collar parents had already paid enough tuition. I was afraid I didn't, I didn't want to have to burden them with, uh, uh, you know, uh, private school um, tuitions, you know, graduate school in the, in, in the sciences, you, you know, usually were able to get funded um, by TAs and by um, fellowships. Uh, and for the most part, it didn't cost you anything. Um, but I wasn't aware of that uh, and, until I actually got to Rutgers. Um, and it, it turned out that Rutgers was one of the best programs in microbiology in the whole world. And, uh, and so uh, I was very, very fortunate that I was in sort of the right place at the right time in that sense. Of, uh, and, uh, and that's how I became interested in virology because my PhD advisor was a virologist in that program. That's great. And Rutgers and Holy Cross are both Phenomenal institutions. Let me ask you this, you, uh, uh, wonderful journey, great story. You had made the point that, you know, uh, like uh, me to some extent, I mean, my mom was a public school teacher and my dad was an accountant. Uh, I'm second generation college student, but you're first generation. What, what, talk a little bit about, you know, were your parents, um, what was the frame when you were in high school that they very much wanted you to go to college? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, okay. And that's why, in fact, they wanted me to go to St. Benedict's because, um, you know, that, that school, my, my father had been born, born and raised in Newark and was very aware of, of the reputation that St. Benedict's had. And, and so he wanted me to go there because he knew that, you know, it would mean um, that I'd get a good education that would prepare me for college. There was never any doubt in either of their minds that, you know, I, I should go on to college. Um, Great. And um, and so once you got to Holy Cross, I mean, that, uh, you know, Chestnut Hill College, you know, where you now uh, are faculty, as you know, has quite a large number of first generation college students, just like you were. Um, do you see uh, first generation college students facing certain challenges? Uh, did you yourself face certain challenges, not insurmountable, but just certain mm -hmm. challenges because you're the first in your family to go? Right, right. You go? Yeah, I mean, as I, as I say, you know, um, it's just having gone through it, you know, before people know what to expect. And, and in our case, we were sort of learning as we went along. Um, I was very well prepared academically. So that part, because I went to a really good um uh, prep school, um, you know, that, that made, that was a little easier. Um, 
but certainly there were issues in terms of finances. I worked summers all the time. Um, you know, um, certainly uh, uh, choosing, you know, uh, as I said before, choosing graduate school, um, you know, my children had a lot more um, help from us than I had from my parents. Um, so we had, I had certainly great support, but, um, you know, certainly um, uh, there was the, the, you know, the challenge of, uh, of sort of what's the next step and how to prepare for that next step and, you know, what, what are the options that are available, um, you know, uh, in, in choosing to, to go to the, to the next step. Um, but, um, you know, I think that um, what Holy Cross had and what Justin Hill has, of course, is uh, that one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection and um, relationship between faculty and, and students. So I, you know, was able to, you know, be from, uh, have um, the opportunity to work very closely with a number of individual faculty, not just in biology, by the way, but in, in some of the other um, um, courses that I took as well, that also had an influence on on me and, and you know, uh, on my work and everything else. Um, when I graduated from Holy Cross and I went on to um, graduate school, I envisioned myself going back and teaching in a, at, a, at a place like Holy Cross. I wound up at Temple Medical School for 30 years, which was the furthest completely different experience than you would have at a small liberal arts college. Um, but <laughs> I've said many times, it took me 30 years, but I finally got back to what I originally wanted to, uh, uh, to do in the first place, which was to teach at a small liberal arts college. And I'm very pleased that I was able to sort of finish my career here at, Ch at Chestnut Hill College. Makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I do think it's so important to underscore, uh, you know, the idea that as a first generation college student, that having the kind of experience that you provide at Chestnut Hill College and that you received at Holy Cross, where you do really have that individualized attention, where faculty know the names of their students and, uh, you know, build a relationship that really is lifelong, not only as a teacher, but as a mentor. Mm -hmm. that, that I, that that's a critical part of what makes a first generation college student succeed. And clearly you have. Yes. I want to thank Dr. Soprano uh, for uh, Dr. Ken Soprano, uh, professor of biology at Chestnut Hill College in Chestnut Hill, just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for uh, joining us today. I would like to thank our viewers for tuning in. Uh, we will see you next time on Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Until next time, take care.